Great. So thank you, Noah, um, and everyone for coming. Um, so I figured we'd start from the beginning. Um, before coming to the US, uh, I had recently lost my grandparents, um, who were the source, and you could even say like gatekeepers of family history and stories. Um, and after losing them, I, I no longer had access to that archive. Um, and it pushed me to start questioning um, and wanting to have more conversations around like, loss and migration and family separation. And at the time I didn't have language to articulate that what I was trying to do was redefine what an archive looked like or sounded like. Um, and, I, and for the most part um, at the core, that's what my thesis is. Um, <clears throat> and my work is highly process-based and often um, feeds into different works. So I wanted to start off with, um, the, hold on one second. Okay. I wanted to start off with um, a few works, like earlier works before I get into the thesis um, so that you can follow along kind of like the process um, and how I got there. So this is a quote um, from Yu Fituan from the text Space and Place. Um, and I'll just read it. A child's spatial frame of reference is restricted. Children's art provides abundant hints of this restriction. Separation is another type of evidence that hints at the child's inability to depict or simply indifference to the spatial relations among objects. For example, the picture of the cowboy on his horse may show a prominent gap between the cowboy's hat and his head and another gap between the cowboy and the horse. I was interested in the way that he speaks about a child's spatial relationship to objects and this influenced um, the ways I was thinking about space and um, memories, especially those uh, linking to like hurricane preparedness in the Caribbean um, that often looks like propping furniture on blocks and um, building sandbag barricades. So this is documentation from my first review. Um, and the title of this piece is Tra Trauma Stays With You. And I was interested in this idea of space and um, how you know, children perceive and engage with space and objects. Um, and people were allowed to walk underneath um, the sculpture and walk through it um, in a way kind of engaging in something that was immersive and transformative. Um, and at the same time, I was, excuse me, I was, um, I started doing these solvent transfer prints um, from photographs I was collecting, um, collecting from friends, um, acquaintances who also experience uh, family separation um, due to migration. Um, and I went through the process of printing the image as a Xerox copy um, and then reconstructing the image using cellophane tape. Um, I was then using acetone to transfer the image. And what was beautiful about this was after pulling the print, um, what became evident was the traces of that reconstruction process. And for me, that was extremely impactful um, and resonated very much thinking about memory and disruption and vulnerability and fragility. Um, <clears throat> so then, you know, like my work, I do a lot of research and at this, Point, I was reading Toni Morrison's Beloved. And there's a section that really resonated with me and um, I'm gonna read it. I was talking about time. It's so hard for me to believe in it. Some things go, pass on, some things just stay. I used to think it was my memory. You know, some things you forget, other things you never do, but it's not. Places places are still there. 
If a house burns down, it's gone. But the place, the picture of it stays. And not just in my memory, but out there in the world. What I remember is a picture floating around out there outside my head. I mean, even if I don't think it, even if I die, the picture of what I did or knew or saw is still out there, right in the place where it happened. So at this point, um, I started doing more research about memory and trauma and thinking about sites. Um, I had recently went home uh, after the break. So after being gone for six months, um, I realized everything changed. Everything about the space changed, but a lot of things also stayed the same. And so when I came back to the US, um, I started thinking more about the place I was in and comparing that to spaces in Jamaica. Um, and that kind of led me to conversations around flooding and precarity and thinking about my family and how um, precarious our lives were. Um, so I, I had thoughts about how water reveals the sense of inequality. So I went back to images of my family and people that I knew in the community that I grew up um, that experienced reoccurring floods. And I wanted to add more layers to the prints that I was doing. Um, and so I started to physically um, engage in this act of flooding using the acetone um, and introducing Gamsol um, into the process. And the surface of the image start to change, um, you know, because of the Gamsol and how it interacted with the acetone and the toner. Um, and so what happens that there becomes, like you see a lot of erasures, different levels of erasures and distortions, which was echoing the flood damage photographs that I had found when I went back home. So this is an example of that, which was just a like eight, five by four photograph that um, I scanned. Um, <clears throat> so I, I felt that the prints, they were becoming more layered and more complex, but um, they still felt restrictive. And that had a lot to do with just the borders of the paper. So I was introduced to Sandra Brewster's work, um, the Blur series, and it influenced the way that I started thinking about scale and about sites and how she uses scale and the blurring of images to talk about migration and movement and identity and the complexity of identity. So I decided to break free of the borders of the paper in my own work. Um, and this was this is a piece called Boy a Big Bala, um, which I, which was like the biggest, so well before it was the biggest, um, like play and scale for me, because it was five feet in height. Um, but I realized like after breaking free of the borders of the paper, that the work starts to, it started to become more expansive automatically. Um, and I started working directly onto the wall. I then introduced the sander um, as a way of adding more marks and erasures um, and this was done over a period of like three days of removing um, but something interesting happened while I was sanding because um, I was sanding and I, it, it, the sander started to reveal layers of paint that existed in that space um, and that made me think about permanence and how um, even after you know, an object or an image that exists in a space, even after it's been covered up, the memory of that still exists. So then I started thinking about color. Um, and it reminded me of Christmas, like Christmas is back home, um, having to paint the outside of our house um, and the grills, everything. And the, the company, um, Berger, they make this brand, brand of paint, um, which is the Magic Coats, and they have these like stock colors. 
Um, and they advertise them or market them as easy to use, affordable. Um, and one of the things I observed is that a lot of these colors were seen in low income communities. So for me, then like the colors visually became a signifier of class and social status. So I started to pay more attention again to the space that I was in. Um, the spaces here in Richmond are unlike places in the Caribbean. Um, the color palette being one of those major differences. <clears throat> so I wanted to in incorporate color as another layer to the prints um, as a marker of difference. Um, so that led me to the work that's also in thesis, um, which is titled Two Generations. Um, and this is going back to images of my family, um, which is also interesting to, to note that I reuse images thinking about um, iteration and how images change even after they've been rep like reprinted. The source of it remains the same, but each print is always different. The marks are different. Um, so this is also another shot from the install. Um, I want to show this piece briefly um, so that you're able to, to kind of see how I got to the piece that's in these, the next pieces and pieces. Um, so this is titled Memories Keep Us Afloat. And I was interested, I'm interested in everyday objects um, and the acts of repurposing. And in this piece, I was interested in the refrigerator as a flotation device. Um, but I was then compelled to rethink the form um, because I started to think about um, going back to thinking about sites and thinking about the street as a site. Um, and it took me to the sound system and my memories of interacting with the sound system. Um, in Jamaica, you can, you can find like a sound man in almost every low income community. Um, so I became interested in, in the sound system as an object, but also as a as a means or a place for expression and community. Um, this is the illustration of the different parts of the sound system. So <clears throat> while researching, um, I also came across uh, this text, and there's a specific section from the text, um, In the Wake, Black and Sleepy by Christina Sharp. I'm just going to read it. Black women and children continue to be cast as less than human victims and agents of natural disasters, whether in the aftermath of the 2010 Haitian earthquake, a boat sinking during a perilous journey, or a hurricane Katrina. And it solidified a lot of what I was reading and observing. Um, I was collecting these flood victim interviews from the internet, from YouTube, Instagram. And one of the things I noticed um, is that it mostly depicted, all the, the interviews mostly depicted women, the Black women, mothers, children. Um, and they were always interviewed in their most vulnerable moments. And I started to question, I started to ask questions of how we consume images and especially those that show black bodies, trauma and vulnerability specifically. So that brought me to this piece, um, which is titled Rain Never Yet Fall One Man Door, which is a Jamaican saying for, um, it pretty much means whatever happens to someone else can also happen to you. Um, <clears throat> and the piece I was, thinking about um, spaces and veranda as a space, but also as a paradox for this inside outside space. Um, and I was pulling images from this short film called Auntie by Lisa Harewood, um, along with the, um, the found footage, footages from the interviews. Um, <clears throat> so now we, it leads us to this um, quote. Black annotation and Black redaction are, are ways to make Black life visible, if only momentarily, through the optic of the door. 
Black annotation and reduction meet the Black anagrammatical and the failure of words and concepts to hold in and on Black flesh. So I went back to the interviews um, and the sound system and decided what needed to happen was that I needed to make my own sound system. Um, I wanted to amplify the voices um, and amplify the testimonies of the, the Black people in those interviews. Um, and by deconstructing them and collaging them, I was trying to, in a way, participate in what Christina Sharp describes as Black annotation and Black reduction. Um, and the, the, ampl the amplification of the sound system with the amplification of the, the, the voices and the sound system, for me, creates a deeper sense of togetherness and demonstrate the shared disparate realities. Um, when I was putting together the sound, it was hard for me to listen to because of how emotional it was, listening to, to the emotional outcry of these people. And I wanted to, in a sense, bring it into another emotional space. And I thought about my mother and the memories I have um, of her uh, on Sunday mornings, listening to Aretha Franklin cassettes. Um, and for me, that always brought me joy. And so I felt it was only right that I added a component like that song into the collage as a way of um, transcending a sense of sorrow. And I'm gonna play real quickly like a very short clip from that. <laughs> <clears throat> so the last piece in the show, um, which is titled Wall, False Sense of Security, is influenced by previous works, but also like actions of hurricane preparedness um, and the spatial references I was I was making in earlier in earlier works. I was also influenced by the work fortified by Karen Oliver and the way she's manipulating materials and thinking about monuments and thinking about space. Um, and particularly I was interested in the gesture of laying the clothes um, between the, the bricks. And I wanted to employ that same gesture in my work thinking about the relationship to the body. So the sculpture consists of um, cinder blocks and used children toys sitting at the base with toys tucked inside um, of the cinder block. And the use of the raw cinder blocks for me becomes a symbol of class, um, but also the way that the um, the way they're all positioned, it kind of give the sense that something had existed somewhere else and it was just removed and placed there. And lastly, I want to leave you with this quote from Derek Walcott, which I think in some way offers, offers a lot of ways in the way that I'm thinking about my own work. Um, so I'll just read it. Poetry, which is perfection sweat but which must seem as fresh as the raindrops on a statue's brow, combines natural and the memorial. It conjugates both senses simultaneously, the past and the present. If the present is the sculpture and the present, the bees of dew or rain on the forehead of the past, there is the buried language and the individual vocabulary and the process of poetry, which is the, which, sorry. And the process of poetry is one of excavation and of self-discovery. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, so now um, uh, we welcome any questions or comments for Kelly. Go ahead, Sylvia. <laughs> Uh, thanks so much, Kelly. Um, that's, I, I think it's a really remarkable 
body of work and installation. And I see so many changes that you made just in the recent past. Um, the uh, one thing that I think is very beautiful, I mean, in, in the sense of a kind of um, poetics of politics is um, the way, if I'm correct, the, the, uh, the speaker system is basically the two refrigerators and you've created a kind of collage on the other side. Is that right? No, um, so the, the sound system is the two refrigerators plus the, um, it's right. like the midsection that has the amp inside of it. Um, and the back just has all the cords that come right. from it. But, um, but, but the back shows you the kind of infrastructure of the refrigerators. And right. the other side has a kind of, um, reads as a, a tower of speakers, right? Yes. And what I find amazing about that is, um, you know, for, for a lot of artists who work with documentary material and research, there always comes a moment where, um, you know, artists have the power to transform the literal. And, and through the transformation of the literal, there is um, a kind of um, layering and increase in, in the meaning that's produced that can't really be reduced to words, you know. And I think you've really achieved that in a, a number of those elements in, in your thesis show. Um, I also would love, you know, I'd really like to commend you for showing the work of the other artists. Because, you know, I, I've done a, a ton of teaching in architecture as well as art. And I've always noticed that in the field of architecture, there's a huge amount of borrowing. And it's not shameful, you know, it's not something to be avoided. It's something to, to, that allows the individual to develop their work further, to, um, to refine it. And, and yet in, in the art world, that tends to be sort of not looked at in a very positive light, right? Because there's a kind of privileging of original, originality. But I think it's very beautiful that you made those references and talked about what you learn from them. So I, I really want to thank you for that. Thank you so much. Kelly, I had one um, thought that we haven't talked about as a committee yet. Um, I know that we had in the past, um, but uh, in some ways, especially showing the um, some of the pictures of the um, the kind of the vernacular architecture and the use of of paint um, in Jamaica in a particular way, and also the use of the um, the sound systems in so in in a particular context, and the way that this this um, thesis show this installation basically becomes a representation that references those instances um, from Richmond, Virginia. Um, but I guess I was wondering, um, what would it mean for this same work to be exhibited actually in Kingston or like, you know, in other areas of, of the Caribbean that may share in some of the, the kind of vernacular references? Like, um, would the work need to change in some way, or does it stay, or does it stay the same, but yet like the conversation becomes different? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, I thought about that. I was just like, what, what would it look like in terms of just the responses, um, thinking about the different spaces, and I think the work wouldn't necessarily change. I think the conversation how people approach the conversation would be different because there is an awareness of these, these objects, um, these cultural objects. And um, I think the conversation I think would be just different because I realized even um, when I was in the, in the space, there are people coming, like people came in and they were just like, oh, these speakers are, are nice. Um, I'm just like, well, they're speakers, yes, but 
It's a sound system. It's a, it's a, it's a different thing. Um, it's not just a speaker. And I think if it was in Jamaica or if it was in like Trinidad or Barbados, it's would be, it would be more recognizable that this is what this is. So I think the conversation would be a little bit different um, and awareness would be there. But nonetheless, I think here, there's still a lot more, there's still more that can even contribute to that conversation too. That's great, thanks. Hi, Kelly. Um, Hi. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about, I feel like there was in, the, in your thesis show, there was like this beautiful shift that happened with the prints where they like almost became murals um, and, you know, still up close have the printed quality. Um, but I don't know what that kind of scale, shift in scale um, revealed to you and um, yeah, what it's like to see this work that started off being like an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper now be like larger than life. Yeah, um, so the the prints in the show uh, were printed 11, 11 and a half feet by one was like seven feet. And then the biggest one was 11 and a half feet by 15 feet, which is the biggest print I've done to date. <laughs> um, and there's something interesting, I think when you move up in scale that it makes it feel monumental. It makes it feel very immersive, um, especially because of um, like the people that I was representing and what I wanted to say about them. I wanted to, to make them feel tall, to make them feel big. Um, and I think having like that's, that scale did that, that it wasn't doing that when it was like really small. Um, and it kind of also reminds me of those images that you'd find on, if you go on a walk and you see like images that's posted up on walls and it's been weathered over, you know, periods of time because of wind and rain. Um, and it's interesting the, even though there were like two, like, well, four prints, they all look different. Like one wall looked like it was, you know, it had the silhouette cut out um, and the edges were different versus like the one that was on the, the darker pink wall um, that felt like it was weathered, you know, through like natural elements. Um, and so I think that that also added to that. I have a question. Hi, Kelly. Hi. Congratulations. It's been such an honor to watch you on this incredibly winding uh, path. And just to see the growth in the work has just been um, just, just, in, just breathtaking. Um, but I had a question for you about ephemera and memory. So ever since I first learned about your practice, one uh, ongoing beat has been um, the interest in ephemera. Um, so I'm interested in hearing you talking, uh, talking about that a little bit more, about why ephemera um, and its relationship to memory. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> the, a lot of the, the work, um, especially the images that I've used so far um, are images of my family and they're the only images that I have. Um, I don't have, like we lost a lot of our, you know, photographs. And I think there's something about um, thinking about like creating memories and representing memories through um, the material, but also um, something that feels intangible through this, through the, the, the use of like paper, but also um, like the wet medium and how together it kind of, it gives the feeling of something intangible um, through the disruption, through the gaps. Um, and yeah, that is something that is, is extremely 
important and, and constant throughout whether it's the sculptures, I think, or even the prints. Um, I think that's something that you can find in all of them, or even just the, the animations that I didn't talk about, um, or even the writing. If you don't have any more questions, I'm happy to pass the torch. <laughs> I I have one question. Um, that thank you for that wonderful artist talk. And um, in some ways, it sort of relates to Noah's um, question about sight. You know, your work references in so many ways community building and um, different kinds of communities. And um, and I know you've worked you know, with uh, many peers and the process is intense um, of, you know, kind of installation and preparation. And um, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about um, collaboration in relationship to um, the present site and um, how you're, you know, how you're thinking about it in relation to like the actual installation or even just processes with your peers. Yeah, um, I didn't realize that um, community was such a big part of my practice until uh, I think it was um, the end of first semester uh, when I did that um, performance with Luis and Brian. Um, and also like after putting together that final review, um, I then realized how important it is, like whether it's the physical kind of putting together of the work in a space, it's getting materials, um, but also it's talking because I, I, I do a lot of my processing through like having conversations with people. Um, and so like from my practice, I think it, it starts from communicating um, to getting materials or even just installing and even making the work. Printmaking is, is one of those things you can't do alone. Um, and that's been proven time and time again, <laughs> even when I've tried to do it alone. Um, and with the final install for thesis, like for thesis, I was amazed at the magic of community and how much people I had connections with that I didn't even realize um, because I went through a crisis and to see how many people were able to just stop what they were doing to help me, it meant so much. And I was, I was amazed and it just, solidifies a lot about um, how much of my practice deals with community in one way or another. If you don't have any last questions. And thank you, Kelly. Yay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>